Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create and grow income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Are you tired of trading your time for money? Do you desire freedom today instead of retirement in 10, 20, or 30 years? I'm MC Lobsher, and this is the Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. My name is MC Lobsher, and thank you so much for spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me on the show. Uh, again, you can check out all of our past episodes at CashflowNinja.com, along with our community resources, tools, and our programs. And of course, I have launched a new book, which I'm very excited about and uh, getting a lot of great feedback on it. Uh, if you haven't picked up my book, you could go to CashflowNinja.com forward slash 21 niches, that's N-I-C-H-E-S, 21 niches, uh, and uh, you can grab a copy of the book. When you buy the book, I'm also giving you access to the book bundle, uh, which includes a digital copy of the book, a audio uh, copy of the book, and also I've curated a library of all the guests that's been on my show talking about these 21 niches, and there's also bonus videos on there. So check it out at cashflowninja.com forward slash 21 niches. That's 21 niches. This is episode number 700. So 700 episodes of uh, the Cashflow Ninja. Uh, and I just want to really start off by expressing my gratitude for your support, for being on this journey with me. I can't believe we've clocked 700 episodes of Cashflow Ninja. And then um, we have clocked over 110 episodes of the Cashflow Investing Secrets podcast, where I share what I've learned from interview, uh, interviewing amazing guests on my show uh, and insights and also other things that I think might be of value uh, for you. All that at CashflowNinja.com. But episode 700, and I've got a very special guest, friend of the show, uh, Doug Casey, uh, the international man, the original international man. Um, Doug's been on the show a number of times, always providing uh, just uh, some incredible insights uh, of what's going on in the world and what you can do about it to position yourself, your family and your, your business and your investments to be on the right side of it. So um, absolutely uh, excited to have Doug back. Doug, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's a pleasure to be back, MC. It actually is. Yeah, great to connect with you. Um, so you've been up to a lot of different things. Uh, move, uh, some relocation, uh, some fantastic uh, uh, adventures online. You've got your own YouTube channel, uh, which I would highly recommend, by the way, for our listeners uh, and our viewers out there. I uh, uh, just put in Doug Casey on YouTube and also I would subscribe on Odyssey and BitChute and so forth. Uh, in case uh, they decide to uh, miraculously move that that show, but you've been you you've been pretty busy, Doug. Um, uh, how are things going on your end, and and what's 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 new? Well, I can't complain, although I believe that in fact there's plenty to complain about uh, <laughs> in the U.S. at this point. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we spoke before uh, the Biden regime was installed in Washington or not. I don't. Call whether we talk before that or not. But now that they're there, we have genuine Marxists in, uh, in command in Washington. And uh, they're actually Bolsheviks. They're, uh, they, they believe the same things. They have the same psychology. That's the most important thing. The same philosophical and psychological makeup as the Bolsheviks did in Russia in 1917 or for that matter, the Jacobins did in France in 1789. Yep. Same damn people, exactly. And, and there are a lot of other instances throughout history where a country actually goes psychotic. There's lots of other indicators of the US going psychotic. One of them is of course this, this vaccine hysteria. Uh, it's, it's turned into a vaccine psychosis. It's gone beyond the level of hysteria at this point. So as much as I enjoy being here in the US with all the advantages and pleasures that the US affords, 
Uh, I'm very happy next week to be returning to uh, my estancia in Uruguay, where they're crazy there too, incidentally. That's not to say that that's a, like a haven of freedom or, any, or anything, but it's a small country. It's a rural country. It's a tourist driven country. Uh, it's a peaceful country, especially in terms of South America. So uh, I'm happy to uh, go back there and get a change of environment. So yeah, everything's been going okay. Can't complain. Yeah, and, that's we're, far. Yeah. and, we're, and we're working, we're starting to work on the fourth book okay. in the novel series, uh, which is gonna be called Terrorist. Uh, I'm trying to take each book up to a higher level. Started out with the politically incorrect uh, book Speculator, because I'm trying to reform the unjustly besmirched reputations of uh, politically incorrect occupations. And uh, we start out with Speculator, which is a book about our hero who's, who's uh, in his early 20s and gets lucky on a mining stock and goes off to Africa, gets involved in a bush war with boy soldiers and all that. It's a damn good book. And then the next book, he uh, becomes a drug lord. Drug lords are all supposed to be bad guys, but we show that a drug lord can be a good guy, as our hero is. And uh, as with Speculator, the government steals all his money from him again. So he becomes an assassin. Uh, and this book, <clears throat> Assassin, got to show you the book. Yeah. Is, um, is about, uh, it's a moral uh, play. Uh, is it right or wrong to be a political assassin? Is it effective or not effective? Does it actually improve things? So it's a, a hell of a story with a lot of uh, a lot of stuff about historical assassinations, kind of looking at it from the other end of the telescope, if you would. And um, so now in the fourth book, we're working. With, but people ought to get Assassin, actually. I, I think it's probably the best of the three. They should get all three. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do, MC, is it's time for a new Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. And Atlas Shrugged is a giant book, like, I don't know, 800, 900 pages. Yep. And uh, what we're trying to do here is uh, do the same thing with a vastly different kind of plot line uh, over the course of seven increasingly politically incorrect novels. So people can take it in bite size, relatively, pieces. Anyway, so that's what I've been up to, I guess, among yeah. other things. That's that's fantastic and uh, fantastic stuff. And I would highly recommend all the books. They're great, and I cannot wait for terrorists because you know one man's terrorist is another man's uh, freedom fighter, right? So yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And if you're and if you're not sure, you're uh, you're you're just a rebel. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, or what? What's the joke that George Carlin said? You know, uh, uh, if uh, what is it? What what do freedom fighters fight? You know, if oh. you know, do, do, do yeah. they fight freedom? That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 uh, fascinating stuff, and I really appreciate what you're doing with that series. And I just remember the impact that uh, Ayn Rand had with all of Atlas Shrugged, and of course, the virtue of selfishness, which uh, is just, I mean, when you read it, you just cannot put it down. <laughs> you, you, you can't. In fact. I almost, I had to, put, but I had to put that, put uh, the virtue of selfishness down when I read the first page because I was so shocked that somebody had crystallized on paper what I'd been thinking rather inchoately for many years. I read it when I was eh, probably 21. So I recommend people buy that when they go on Amazon too. It's a work of genius. Yeah, fantastic stuff. And I can't wait to see the, the next release and what's coming there. Um, but I mean, it's been an interesting time over the, the past 20 months, right? We've, we've gone from 15 days to slow the spread to now. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I, you cannot uh, do anything else but look at this in, in just bewilderment that now it's, um, you know, injection mandates, uh, injection passports just to basically participate as a normal functioning human being in, 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 a, in, a, in society. Um, which is just very eerie, of course, growing up in South Africa and seeing pass laws uh, and uh, segregation firsthand to see and witnessing that this is, these are concepts that are just accepted across the board, it seems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 
people have turned into genuine whip dogs that they aren't affronted or shocked or disgusted when some nobody asks them to see if their papers are in order. I mean, this is this is just absolutely insane. Maybe it's me. I don't know. What's the re- there's lots of reasons that I, I could posit for why things have gone so badly. I mean, maybe one of them is that a quarter of the adults in the U.S. are on things like Prozac and Xanax and a hundred other uh, drugs that you know turn you into a semi-zombie. Could be that, yep. or uh, or could be definitely is that for the last several generations, uh, people have gone off to be indoctrinated in the school system, which has been totally captured by the Marxists and the welfare statites and socialists and horrible people like that. And they indoctrinate kids. And, um, you know, St. Ignatius Loyola said it, uh, and Lenin said it too, uh, give me a kid until he's eight years old and he's mine for life. And it's true, you imprint these crazy thoughts socialist type thoughts on a kid's mind. And it's really hard to get rid of them. Uh, yep. It's put there early. So yeah, I'm afraid the bad guys are winning at this point. Yeah, it's it's just quite incredible. And just staying on the schools for a second. I mean, th- this is the future generation, what they're doing there. Uh, I mean, some of the behaviors uh, of adults, I, I can't even I can't even explain it. I mean, you have people are very excited that they want to put masks on children and have it on them constantly in their schools. They get excited talking about it. Um, But even if you just look at schools in general, I mean, there was a meme going around. (laughs) and We're living in this age of memes where they would have they would have pictures up of either a school or a prison. And you had to guess whether it's a school or a prison. (laughs) And I tell you, I was wrong 50% of the time. And when you drive past them, uh, I mean, still you had to, you now have to pause and ask yourself a question. Is, it, is that a school or a prison there? Because it looks pretty much like a prison. Well, actually, uh, there, are, there, there are a lot more analogs between the two of them because it costs about $50,000 a year to keep the average prison in prisoner in prison for a year. Yep. And let's say 50,000, it could be a lot more, is what it costs to send a kid to college. But maybe the prison does less damage than the college does, uh, quite frankly. You know, I went to college uh, for four years uh, during the days of the uh, drug. And, you know, we fought and won the uh, revolution, the the drug revolution. And then we fought and won the uh, sexual revolution in those days. It was kind of fun and it was kind of a privilege to go to college. Not everybody did. And it wasn't terribly expensive like it is today. But if I'd had good counsel when I was in high school, even back then, I wouldn't have gone to college. And it was much more valuable and not nearly as PC as it is today, not not by any means. So uh, I counsel kids today in high school when I get a chance do not go to college. These are four very important years. Uh, don't waste all that money and indenture yourself with all that money. Uh, take those four years, lay out a plan, and you can turn yourself into a Renaissance man during those four years instead of sitting in a desk listening to nobody's lecture you about stupid and worthless things in most cases. Yeah, no, absolutely. And staying on, on the education side of it too, um, I mean, we, we're seeing some trends here that a lot of entrepreneurs are already capitalizing on, uh, the, the education trends. I mean, the statistics that are coming out on homeschooling, it's one of the biggest mm. trends. Uh, people are starting to realize, I think this is, this is actually kind of, if we can look at this in a positive light, because parents have started to see what happens in schools and happen to their children, and a lot of them were pretty shocked. Um, so the homeschooling is up on the rise. And I think people are also started to realize that, uh, especially when students came home for, from college and they did all these virtual classes that, you know, you have to, you have to look at what the value proposition is. Um, we're, I mean, we're now into the fourth industrial revolution. We have machine learning, AI, robotics, um, 
the internet of things, 5G, there is, and it's a skill economy. It's no longer a jobs economy, which the Prussian school model delivered for folks for. Yes. So if you look at the, the value proposition of college is, are you a doctor, lawyer, or, I mean, there's no way that just a, a, just a standard uh, a, a degree is going to offer any value because if you go into college now for what, for four years, it's 2021. What does the world even look like in 2025? You have yes. any skill set yeah. that you would learn in four years now in college that you would go, could go out in the marketplace and do anything in 2025. Well, you don't really learn a skill set in college because yeah. most people wind up taking things like English or sociology or psychology or, God forbid, gender studies or really soft subjects like that. Uh, anyway, you can't buy an education. I mean, it's insane paying all that money to get a piece of paper to say that you logged four years at some goofy institution. I mean... With the internet and a little bit of discipline, you've got all the knowledge of the world at your fingertips, basically for free. So it's actually insane to go to college. And if you want to chase girls or boys and drink beer, hey, you don't need to go to college to do that, believe it or not. Yeah, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, but again, there's so much, and I've already started to see entrepreneurs got, coming into the space and especially on the value side um you see great educational companies that are now doing children's books uh which is just fascinating i mean it's, uh, there's a company called brave books for example uh that are putting out great great uh books monthly for children and of course you've got the tuttle twins and connor boyack and and so forth doing great uh work from a libertarian standpoint and libertarian principles um, in, in the and messages in the book, so there. I mean, there's so much opportunities uh, for folks to to capitalize on that. Um, yeah. So one of the questions, Doug, that a lot of folks in, in our community uh, uh, would ask me, they look at this and they say, "Look, we're seeing over the first 20 months. I think the joke was, how was your how was your free trial in 20 months of Marxism? Are you enjoying it?'" <laughs> Yeah. So they understand what, 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 what's going on. You're making your way down uh, to Latin America. I mean, it seems that if you're going to countries in Latin America and Africa and so forth, they might not necessarily have the bandwidth uh, from a government standpoint to uh, enforce all of these really bad uh, draconian ideas that they have as, for example, uh, governments in the, in the West and especially the Five Eyes uh, governments, right? Well, I'd like to believe that. Uh, I've, I've been to 155 or so countries. I've lived in 10. And uh, the problem is this. You're right. Some of these smaller, less, less, less um, advanced, uh, if you want to use that word, countries. Yeah, you're right about that. But on the other hand, you look at the people that go into government. And they're the same type everywhere. You got two kinds of people. You've got people that like to control the physical universe, things, creating things, moving things, making things. And then you got people that like to control and manipulate other people. And that's the type that always goes into government. So these people in government, everybody thinks they ought to run the world and they're important and, and so forth, but they are the worst kind of people. They're the kind of people that you don't even want to say hello to. Uh, and they gravitate towards government. So everywhere in the world that has a government, you get these basically criminal type personalities that run the governments. Some are better, some are worse. But uh, it's, a, it's a play. It makes me wonder what the hell is the matter with the average human that uh, he actually puts up with this nonsense. Yeah, because you're, you're starting to see it now in the West. I mean, for folks that have followed, um, I would say, Latin American politics and African politics for a while, it's pretty simple. You want to get in power so that you can reward your friends and punish your enemies. Yes. It's pretty pretty straightforward. That's, that's the name <laughs> of the game. <laughs> that's, that's why a brother-in-law all of a sudden becomes a major, you know, contractor, you know, construction contractor, you know, if, uh, if, if, 
uh, he's he's brought his brother-in-law gets into power, and the other folks lose all of the contracts. But I think people are starting to see that now um, in the in the West too that nobody's coming to save them. There's no there's no man or woman on a white horse <laughs> leading so, leading them out of this. It, in fact, in fact, it's worse than that because. Uh, I hate to say something that sounds like a Republican could say it, uh, because I don't have any respect for the Republicans. But um, the fact is that the United States, or I should say America actually, was unique in that it was the only country in the world's history that actually underwrote and promoted and, and made its essence you know, certain characteristics uh, that are unique to Western civilization uh, as well. Like what other country actually built its ethos around free thought and free speech and free markets and uh, limited government and, uh, oh my God, the concept of liberty, the concept of progress, uh, privacy, property rights, rule of law. I mean, these things are actually unique to America and the people that are in charge now, certainly in Washington, but in a lot of the state capitals and a lot of the county seats and cities, yep. they despise these things. They want to wash this all away. And the problem is, is when uh, the idea of America's walked away, the whole world has got no place to run. Yep. Where are you going to run? <laughs> so it's a yeah. problem. Yeah, because that was one of the first things. And I came here in 2001. So this was, I mean, there was already a lot of problems <laughs> then. Um, uh, and this was prior to 9-11, but um, I just couldn't believe the upward mobility too in the US that the, some of this, the things still exist because sometimes you go to certain places and yeah, you can find your niche. You know, you can find a higher ground. That's why I love the name of the higher ground series books um, and an unlevel playing field with, uh, as you've shared. Uh, but the upward mobility is just if you come here with a certain work ethic and certain ideas and creativity, um, I mean, the, the, the sky is, uh, is the sky is the limit. So, um, yeah, because I one of the questions, like I said, where do people go? Where do where do folks go? And there's no there's nowhere to go now because everywhere is pretty much under the same, I would say, control or folks that think the same, which kind of binds them together which was pretty interesting too. Doug, you've yeah. traveled all over the world. You've seen so many different cultures. You've lived in different countries, different languages, different cuisine. You know, um, people have different experiences. They have different worldviews. They have different ways of solving problems, which makes us all so unique. But essentially over the past 20 months, <laughs> it, it, everybody was handed the same hammer to hit the same nail, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I don't know how this current hysteria, or I should say psychosis, because it's beyond a hysteria. I'm not sure how it's going to wind up, uh, quite frankly. But one possibility is we're going to have an actual civil war of some type in the United States uh, and maybe in some other countries as well. Uh, and I point out that uh, the unpleasantness of uh, 1861 to 1865 in the United States was not an actual civil war. Yep. It was a war of secession, which is very different from a civil war. Civil war is one where two groups are trying to take over the same land area, the same government. Not the yep. case uh, back then. It was a war of secession where the South just wanted to go its own way. And then we can get into this whole thing about, well, what about slavery and all that? Actually, that had relatively little, believe it or not, to do with what happened back then. But that's a different subject. I think that the people in the red, the red people and the blue people in this country now are so antagonistic towards each other. They, they can't even talk to each other, quite frankly. And that is when they should not be part of the same political entity anymore. So they should divide. Problem is that... Uh, it's really hard to divide because there have been patches and all over the country. It's not like the Mason-Dixon line and everybody below it kind of is the same and above it like there was 150 years ago. <clears throat> it's different now. So uh, I don't know how this is gonna wind up, but uh, I think it could be really nasty. Uh, and it, it, it's actually rather scary. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, you know, you know the divorce is on the cards. So are you going to stay married and just be miserable, both of you? Or could you do it peacefully at least? You know, so big picture, draconian governments. We've seen insane things, as I mentioned, you know, pass laws, mandates, segregation, a philosophy of segregating the public, which I, I thought were over that. We've seen men heavily armed walking around in French cafeterias and restaurants asking for papers. Um, yeah. We have a very polarized public, very divided. It's global. Um, and it, I think they're just going to turn it up. I mean, because the hysteria is not stopping. Um, I, I mean, this, it's just out of it's actually just out of control. I mean, you <laughs> you you've seen the clips lately of late night talk show hosts because uh, nobody watches them. So I guess they just have to be hyperbolic of the stuff that they put out. But it's just the insanity continues. Um, so for business owners and investors in this climate and this environment. So obviously there's a couple of things to do. There's taking care of yourself physically and your family. And then also protecting your business and investments. What are some of your thoughts on, you know, the economy, on markets, and then what folks can do in this environment? Because, uh, yeah, it looks like there's there's many many different variables, uh, which looks disconnected, but they are kind of connected. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing? Well, uh, I'm of the opinion that we're already into what I call the greater depression. I call it the greater depression because it's gonna be much worse and much different and much longer lasting than the uh, unpleasantness of 1929 to 1946. So that's the in economic environment that we're now looking at. And um, this COVID hysteria, which will be followed by or supplemented with um, global warming hysteria adds into it same people same beliefs uh gonna make it much worse than the economy so what should the average guy do about it if people are worried about this first thing i'd suggest is that if you have a job look to quit the job you don't want to be working for somebody else because when you are an employee you are the effect of something that somebody else causes. You can be fired, you can be manipulated, you have to follow instructions, do what you're told. So everyone should try to be an entrepreneur. And that's, I think that's really important in the years to come. So you don't rely on a job. Having a job, a very concept is kind of degrading. I mean, yeah, you should have a job to learn skills. And all. Okay, that's great. But you should be an entrepreneur if you possibly can. So that's one thing they should do, number one. Uh, number two is that you should, uh, doesn't matter, well, if you have to have a job for whatever reasons they might be, get a second job part-time. Uh, there are advantages to that. You'll earn more money uh, so you can save more uh, and, and you'll consume less because <laughs> you'll have less time to go out and party. And of course, I like to enjoy and party as much as the next person, but when you're going into a really nasty economic time, you want to have some capital in your own possession that will give you room to run, room to move, room to take advantage of opportunities that present yourself. Second thing that you want to look to do. Uh, third thing you should look to do, if you produce more than you consume uh, and save the difference, how do you save it? Well, don't save it in dollars because the dollar is going to become a dead duck. Infl retail inflation is going to get out of control in the future. That's, it's not, uh, what's that word that idiot that's running the Federal Reserve said? It's not transitory. I think that was the word he used. Uh, it's not. It's, it's endemic and it's growing and it's going to be growing rapidly. So how do you save if you can't save? save in a, anyway, putting money in a bank, they pay you nothing, uh, literally nothing for it but your money is at risk at that bank uh, and you have no privacy whatsoever, uh, I suggest people buy small gold coins and silver coins, keep them in your own possession. That's about the only thing you can do. And the third thing, fourth thing, I guess, if uh, after you uh, have built enough capital, then you should learn to speculate. Most people confuse speculating with gambling. 
to totally different. But most people know nothing about economics or finance, two different things actually. But uh, so you gotta educate yourself. And I don't mean take an economics course in college. That's, a, that's 180 degrees the wrong way to turn. Uh, learn to speculate because you speculate when there's government creates distortions in the way people act and the way markets work. And that's a bad thing, but a speculator can capitalize on those things. Huh? What speculations are interesting now? People don't want to hear about the theory, okay? I think the theory is interesting and it's important to know yeah. the theory to be effective at this. But what people want it, well, yeah, okay, cut that stuff. Give me what I should do now. That's another mistake, incidentally, because what I think you should do now could change radically next week. <laughs> and people won't know that and they'll get hammered. Anyway, that said, I think that right now, an excellent speculation is small mining stocks and gold, especially, but other things. And there are certain commodities which are very hard to speculate in for a number of reasons. Like for instance, natural gas, which I'm long a lot of right now, uh, and uranium. I'm into uranium mining companies. Mm -hmm. All this stuff has done well recently, but it's gonna do much better. But uh, you gotta take advantage of these chaotic times. <clears throat> Most people are just in the stock market because it's been going up. Chances are excellent. The stock market is gonna crash and they'll lose everything. It's not a prediction, but I think it's a probability. So that's where I am. Uh, that, general opinion yeah no appreciate that um and and that was the other thought i mean does the stock market of course the, i mean the bubble just gets bigger and bigger <laughs> yeah uh, it, it, i mean at this stage is it on the cards i mean because we have the the plunge protection team that it seems that every single time there's some volatility in choppy waters that uh there is a <laughs> There, there is someone uh, providing smooth sailing conditions relatively quickly or buying, buying a bunch of uh, uh, equities back up to prop it up. Well, it, it's entirely possible that the Federal Reserve will actually start buying stocks at some time. A number of other central banks have done this in the past. The uh, Hong Kong Central Bank has uh, bought stocks during the uh, Asian meltdown and they got lucky and made a lot of money. The Swiss Central Bank has actually just turned into a hedge fund itself and they've gotten lucky so far. They're one of the largest holders of Apple. Okay, they've been lucky so far, good for them. But um, uh, it's not a game I wanna play. Uh, I'm, I'm not a trader. Speculators yeah. all different from a trader. So, um, but you know, uh, most people don't have any familiarity with with the markets and the details of how they work and they take their investment advice from talking heads on television so uh that's a formula for disaster i'm afraid yeah and it looks like i mean at this stage the real economy is completely disconnected from what has been portrayed you know if you look at the and and just from where i'm looking at the prime target over the last 20 months has been your small and medium businesses, right? Which employs the majority of people in the United States, especially. So you lock them down, you shut them down completely. And when they were allowed to be open and back up, they couldn't operate at the same capacity. They had to spend all this money for extra stuff and hand sanitizer and all these yeah. different things. So you were operating at 50% and then 75% yeah. and then 100%. And, and now you want to raise taxes on them. Uh, so that that's the second one. And then I also saw that the IRS increased their capability by 50%, hiring more agents to go after who? Small well, businesses. They, that's, that, that's right. These idiots in Washington are hiring 80,000 new IRS employees. And they think it's a good thing because these are people that are employed. Employment goes up. Right. That's, it's worse than hiring people to, to dig ditches during the day and other people to fill them in at night and saying they're both employed because uh, the IRS, at least that's a, a zero, a kind of a zero sum thing. But hiring the IRS people is actually a negative. So now th this is, uh, this is just, and, and worse than that, a lot of businesses, small businesses can't get employees. 
That's right. Yeah. yeah. Because there's so many people that are collecting government handouts. We're collecting big government handouts until recently, but they're still collecting smaller ones. And a lot of people still aren't paying their rent, like about 3 million, and about 3 million more aren't paying their mortgages. Gee, I wonder if they'll get to skate forever. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, looks, it looks good until the bill comes due. And the bill is coming due, I think, really, really soon. So yeah. Precipice. And then you also now, of course, who's enforcing these mandates and these passports? There isn't at this stage, I mean, I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but there isn't at this stage some uh, government entity walking around yet uh, asking for papers and seeing if everybody is, um, you know, following these crazy, uh, I don't even know if they're laws, quite frankly. I would, um, but whatever they are, whether they're mandates or whether it's regula regulations or whatever they're referred to, to enforce it, the small businesses have to enforce it. So if you're in New York, the restauranteur has to be the person to ask their, um, their customers coming in whether they have the correct papers or not, which now also puts another burden on them. And I mean, you're essentially like the media, the businesses over 100 employees which has become the next target after the smaller businesses were targeted, they now have to enforce it. Otherwise they get fined, right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I don't run, run a bit. I sold my business, thank God, a couple of years ago. But if I still ran a business today, I don't know how I deal with all this stuff because I just wouldn't want to do it. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people feel that way too. They're, caught between a rock and a hard place. They, they don't want to do what they're told with these stupid regulations, but if they don't, the government will land on them like a ton of bricks. So what do you do? I mean, try to sell your business and it's, let somebody else mess with it and uh, use the money to, to speculate or, or, or maybe just, just piss it away to enjoy yourself while you still can. I'm not sure, but uh, this all comes down to government and government comes down to the philosophy of the general society. And I'm afraid that the general phil philosophy and views on the way the world works, put it that way, philosophy sounds you know, too ethereal and irrelevant. Let's just talk about views on the way the world does and should work. Of the average American have become very degraded over time, over the last couple of generations. And uh, consequences of that are going to be very, very bad. And we're moving into them right now, right now. This isn't, you know, in the never come see, uh, in the future things will get bad. Well, because things always cyclically get good and they get bad. That's the way, you know, that's the way the world works. But I'm talking about now, right now. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it's going to provide a lot of, as you mentioned, the distortions in the marketplace. Um, you know, growing up in South Africa, I'm already looking at, you know, the opportunities that there are in home security, uh, home security systems, uh, private contractors. They made a lot of money in South Africa. I mean, most South Africans still now pay a bill every month to a private police force, basically, because there's no, there's no police that patrols the area. Um, it's kind of strange to say that, but I could see opportunities like this spring up in parts of the U.S. and, and most part of the U.S. Because there's good, I mean, there will be little trends like that, privacy trends, you know, so, so, many, so many different things to capitalize on. Yeah, and there are other things that are falling apart in the U.S. too. It's like uh, one thing that I think we should be I don't know what good being concerned about it does, but um, war between yeah. states is like part of the uh, human genetic code. And I'm afraid that World War III is gonna be once again, much different and much worse than World War II, which was much different and worse than World War I. And I think that World War III well, first of all, all the junk that our military is buying, you know, F-35s and Ford class carriers and all the rest, this is all garbage, this is all junk, it's like battleships. 
before World War II or cavalry before World War I, same thing. But the, you know, another thing that's going on is with the Bolsheviks in charge, the nature of the military is becoming highly degraded now. It's, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. The, the general staff in the U.S. are all just political hacks, actually. And uh, the effect they're having on the average soldier, who has to be vaccinated for one thing, a lot of these guys, hey, I don't want to. So what's going to happen? You're going to be court-martialed? Or, it, it's, it's just horrible. And relevant to what you said before about private police forces, yeah, they're going to be on the upswing. No question about that. But uh, I think private militaries on the nature of the nature of Blackwater, which maybe doesn't have the best reputation and may or may not deserve the bad reputation it's got. That's uncertain in my eyes. But uh, there's going to be more of that type of thing too. But that presents another opportunity um, yeah. for some people. Plenty of opportunities in this uh, environment that will be changing uh, completely. Um, one last question for you, Doug, is on technology. I know that you're, you're always fascinated by technology and science and the developments uh, in it. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that and some of the things that you're seeing there? Well, I've long been a believer in the correctness of what Ray Kurzweil said. And Ray Kurzweil is the chief technology officer of Google, but he's also a self-made billionaire and a an entrepreneur who has started many companies and so forth. Anyway, uh, he, he's been promoting the idea of the singularity, which is to say that all the technologies in the world, we're talking uh, artificial intelligence and robotics and nanotechnology and biotech, a whole bunch of things, computer tech, of course, are advancing at the rate of Moore's law. And his guess is that in a generation, uh, it's going to reach a singularity where magic will happen. So the good news is that if you can just stay alive through these tough times for the next 20 years, with a little bit of luck, you know, magic might happen. You might be able to live as long as you want, for one thing. That's one possibility. So, you know, it's not all gloom and doom. I mean, there are good things on the horizon. On the other hand, if the bad guys, governments and collectivist status destroy enough capital, maybe uh, technology, which is capital intensive today, much more in the past, uh, won't have the capital to make the advances. So this could all come unglued. Maybe the supply chains in the world will come unglued and you'll have no food in any of the supermarkets because it's all imported from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. And I don't know what the average guy does if there's not food he can buy in the food store and the money that he uses to pay for it is no good. I mean, this is, this is you know, a serious disaster. It's possible. All kinds of, you know, I can see things are unbelievably good possible and really unbelievably bad possible, including World War III, which would be a cyber war and a bio war. Actually, I didn't complete that previous thought. So um, anyway, Kind of stay tuned. It'll, it'll be really interesting to watch. I plan on watching it from a more or less secure location on my widescreen as opposed to out my front window. <laughs> with, the, with the song in the background, uh, Street Fighting Man, right? Street Fighting Man, yes. That's probably my favorite uh, Stone song, which uh, I was very pleased was used uh, as the you know, final theme in V for Vendetta which is a fantastic movie everybody should see. Yeah, see ab again. yeah, absolutely. And I just want to uh, close out by just the, the recommendation of being an entrepreneur. You know, for folks that that is still daunting, you know, entrepreneur solves problems. And do you think there are problems right now that people have and challenges? Enormous. There's, there's more problems that for, for all the entrepreneurs combined right now to solve. So there's yeah. a lot of opportunity. That's absolutely right. Everybody has problems. Everybody has, in fact, dozens of problems. And it's up to an entrepreneur to find how he can solve other people's problems and make money, make money doing it and make everybody happy. It's a win-win situation. It's actually, in, in uh, 
in this last book. I got to I got to promote this thing again, MC. Yeah, Let's absolutely. See. There we go. It's Assassin. Assassin. It uh, a sub theme of this book uh, relates back to the 1950s and early 60s television series Have Gun Will Travel, where uh, the hero Paladin is a problem solver. That's what he does. And he prefers nonviolent solutions whenever possible to solve the problems. So good model, actually. People ought to, ought to tune into YouTube and watch that series. It's, it's actually great. Uh, absolutely. All the books are available on Amazon. So Doug Casey, Assassin is his latest one. And there's another one coming. Uh, which I'm salivating over, ter uh, Terrorist. So a great, great series. And then also, please make sure you do follow Doug on YouTube. Just type in Doug Casey. He does a fantastic job with Matt Smith, um, which he does a phenomenal job. Um, well, we do have, a, we have a, do have a blog, as long as we're doing a kind of a commercial, internationalman.com. Yeah. Internationalman.com. Ab absolutely. Perfect. You can uh, stay in touch with everything Doug there and read his thoughts and great articles to contribute. Contributors to International Man is fantastic. The YouTube channel and then, of course, uh, the books. Doug, thank you so much for coming on and uh, having a conversation and providing so much value for my audience. Safe travels down uh, to Latin America. And uh, until we speak next time, looking forward to, to see what the world looks then. <laughs> you can read all the facts, MC. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and thank you to you, the viewer and the listener. Uh, uh, appreciate you spending your most valuable resource, your time once again with me on the show. Check out all of our episodes at cashflowninja.com, also community tools, resources, and programs. And of course, you could grab a copy of my latest book at cashflowninja.com forward slash 21 niches. Until then, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives. So situation and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.